The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors, Woodland Stud, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, Brecken Farms, Stonewall Stud, IRT, it's your horse and our passion, Australasian Wide Garrard's Horse and Hound, Rakiro Racing Stables, Lincoln Farms, the clubs Alexandra Park, Cambridge Raceway, Ashburton Trotting Club, Addington Raceway and Harness Racing New Zealand. Hi everyone, welcome into this edition of your box seat and yes once again a big thank you to our stable of sponsors. Michael Guerin, huge news coming out of Addington Raceway. In a moment we'll hear from Darren Williams to get the latest in terms of uh, what's going on there building into IRT New Zealand Cup week. But it's significant news, I can assure you of that. Yeah, it is, uh, Greg. We've all heard the news on Tuesday that we're not going to have the Cup Week we're used to. It's very sad news. Um, we need to keep things in perspective, Greg. It's not sad news in the, the scheme of what COVID has done to many other places in the world or even, in fact, to people in this country. But for people who love this and dedicate their lives to this and people who work at clubs like Addington and Rickerton and lots of people involved, Greg, yeah, it, it's a really tough time because Cup Week is not just about the racing, it's an opportunity for people to get together and see each other and enjoy themselves. And there hasn't been enough of that in the last 18 months or so. So like lots of people, Greg, I'm hoping what we're about to hear from Darren has at least some potential, maybe, for a slight improvement on Tuesday morning's announcements. All right, so let's get straight into it. Earlier today, I caught up with Darren Williams and got the latest about a cup like no other. Darren, you promised us that you'd come on the box seat and give us the latest. What are we looking like for IRT New Zealand Cup Day? Well, Greg, um, we want to give people some surety. That's what we've, of course, wanted, and that's what everyone else wants, people that have booked motels, people that are travelling. Um, and people that already had bookings with us. So they want some surety about what's exactly going to happen to them on IRT New Zealand Cup Day. Our date, our cut-off date for um, making that decision has come and passed. And unfortunately, we're still at level two at the moment, with no indication that that's going to get better in the next two weeks based on Auckland potentially being, and Waikato potentially being at level three for another two weeks. So. Um, we said we would go past this date of the 18th and make a decision, that's what we've done. So we've got a plan that operates at level two, which unfortunately means the public aren't here. All right, so no public. Step me through the groups and how that's all going to work that can attend. Yeah, so effectively we go down from a crowd of about 20,000 down to about 1,200 um, under this current level setting. Um, so we want to make that an industry day, we want to look after the people that we know have a connection to the industry, either to our club as members or as owners and participants of the horses that are racing on the day, plus our business partners and sponsors and a few others. We have to do that in an environment that we can accommodate all of the, um, one, the order and direction from Harness Race New Zealand and the mandated regulations in place by government for hospitality and events. Um, we're not one or other, we're both. Um, so one of the comparisons we've drawn just recently is the rugby, just recently with um, Canterbury's game over here, effectively just a spectator sport. Enter the property, sit down, watch the game and leave. And you're there for a short period of time, an hour and 40 minutes. Here you're here for the whole day. You've got hospitality, which means there's food and drink involved as soon as that's involved. They have to be seated, they have to be waiter service, they have to stay apart. You have to go through that whole drama of keeping each of those bubbles separate from each other. So we're going to operate seven or eight different bubbles um, throughout the course, all with separate entrances, separate catering staff, separate waiter staff, cleaners and everything else that goes with it. So scaling that up to an incredible number is just completely unrealistic. Um, so we get the, how frustrating that is for everyone. So the people that we're going to have on course on the day will be the owners of horses that are racing on the day, and I'll step you through that in a minute. Some members of our club, some participants um, from the industry uh, as invitees and the sponsors and business partners. All right, let's start with owners then. How does that work? Yep, so the owners, effectively, it's a scaled up version of what we're doing now. So there'll be a working bubble which is the stables bubble, which gives you the access to see your horse. So if you're an owner of a horse racing on the day, you can go into that area. No partners, no children. That ability to go in there includes the stables, 
Twiggers will be fully open for seating. Food will be operating from on the lawn here where the barbecue would normally operate. No alcohol, but access to the stables roof where there'll be some seating and umbrellas and things up there. Um, the cost of that, zero. But you will have to have a ticket. So it's a ticketed event. So when nominations close for both days, we'll go out to all of those people and you will register using a link and you'll get yourself a ticket. So even though the ticket is zero in cost, you'll have to have a ticket. Separate to that, we will have the ability to have some hospitality and we've had to work through all of the connotations of how that would work. So if you're an owner of a horse racing on the day, you can buy hospitality. You can buy it for you and a guest, which is an improvement on where we're at at the moment. So if you're an owner, you can bring a partner with you. It's $150 a person, all inclusive. Includes your reserve table or your, your table area in there, your uh, food throughout the day, antipasto, plated lunch, dessert, afternoon tea, tea and coffee, and all of your beverages. So drinks package is included in that. So all inclusive price. And one of the reasons we settled on that is just so much easier to deal with than putting your hand up and saying, I need three more beers to this table and a waiter having to come over and you're having to pay for it at the time and then they have to go back and then you're not getting the attention of someone. It's just so much easier to operate and we think that's a reasonable price for that. Um, so that's how the owners will operate. As I say, both those will have a link sent out to the people that have nominated horses for the, for the races and the same thing will be repeated on show day. But they don't have the option of doing both. No, so the people that choose hospitality will get all of that, plus access to most of the seating bowl, it'll be socially distanced, and down to the uh, grassed area to watch their horses adjacent to the uh, left-hand side of the winning post. The only thing they don't get is the ability to mix with the other bubbles, so they cannot go into the stable. So if you choose hospitality, you can't go and see your horse on the day. Membership is separate, but you'll be communicating everything associated with that directly to them? Yeah, so obviously we can't accommodate the full membership on the day. Uh, but members will have the ability to purchase a ticket, very similar to the owners, a couple of options there for members. Um, if there is too much demand for that, then there may have to be a ballot for that, but we'll see what happens at once we go out with that, and that, that's already in play now. And obviously the horse people associated with the horses racing, similar to what it has been for every other race meeting, they must yep. register. Yeah. That, that yep. group will register. Effectively all of those people will be required to have a ticket that are going there, the owners. The other bubble will register in the same manner. That what about show day? Just a repeat, it's exactly the same. One piece of positive news that you've been able to come up with is around the presentations um, and how the photos for, for the winning connections, how that's all going to work. Yeah, look, that's one of the real frustrations. Uh, we've run some reasonable races recently and haven't been able to do a presentation. We've been working really closely on how we can make that work. And the big key to it was the change a couple of weeks ago to outdoor events where you're effectively, as long as you can keep the people separate in an area, you can potentially mix two bubbles. So now with the owners having some hospitality and owners having the ability in the staples, if you had to keep those people separate, you'd have to do it at presentation time as well, which is just not palatable. So now that we can do that, we will, we will be having presentations. The people will be kept a metre apart. They will be socially distancing. There'll be some other protocols around it, uh, but we will do the presentations for the feature races on the day. People are gonna be able to get a photo. Uh, the big syndicates are a little bit of a problem, uh, but we have a number of solutions as to how that will work. If a large syndicate wins a race, Franco Indy looks like he could be one of the favourites for the, for the uh, Woodland Size Stakes final. If he won, we've got some solutions about whether they'll have their photo taken with the horse or whether they'll be socially distanced, the horse will have left and they have a photo taken after that. Darren, for the majority of people, 117 years of history is about to change, therefore the off-course participation is going to be enormous but there's a there's a heap of information SENZ are going to be here on course with live updates obviously trackside uh, the box seat will have an extensive preview which should be out by either Sunday night or Monday morning so there's there's going to be a lot of information there yeah look TAB have been really good we're still working with them on a number of things that we can try and put in place hopefully um, as you say the box seat we're going to have a preview there SEN are going to be here for the week, uh, so not only on the two days, but also broadcasting from one of our 
private suites, so look, tremendous support from, from that group. Um, what we're looking at is the ability for you to have the cup at your place. So we're looking at a marketing campaign that'll come out towards the end of the week that will give you the ability to host cup day in your own hospitality venue or in your own place. So giving people some tools that will assist them with that, I guess there's a whole lot of people out there that might have once bought a sweepstake ticket. Someone said, give me five bucks and they've handed over five bucks and that's all they know about it. Um, but the ability for someone to be hosting one at home and go, how does this actually work and what do I do? Um, we'll have some information that will be available to them. Darren, as briefly as you can, can you sum up Kaikoura Cup Day and the Cup Trials? Yes, yeah, so Kaikoura, um, you know, is hellishly unfortunate for them to be in level two as well. As I've said before, very important the Kaikoura race at Kaikoura for Addington, let alone the rest of the industry. It signalled the start of Cup meeting and start of party zone. So, you know, really feel for the guys there. Um, we've been able to accommodate them by hosting the meeting here effectively. It'll operate just like any other level two meeting. Um, we'll send comms out to the owners on Kaikoura's behalf. They'll register just like they do and they'll have a choice of spectators or the stables bubble. I think Kaikoura hosting a small event is a private function on course, but effectively that will be it. Cup trials will go ahead here at Addington. I think that we're not sure how many we might get in the cup trial because some will take the opportunity at Ashburton as we've seen and some will take the opportunity to race at Kaikoura. Whether we have a cup trial or not will be up to the participants but the trials will be there on that day. The thing to remember about that is it's going to be at level two at the moment as unless anything changes which means only the owners of the horses racing that day can attend. Um, we won't have the ability to go out to those people because the fields aren't done till the day before, so there'll be a registry at the gate. So we're relying on the participants helping us by only those people turning up. If you turn up with other people that are not owners, you will be rejected at the gate. You just touched on, if the government changes anything, does that change anything? Are there the opportunities for the public late in the piece to attend this day? If things change, there is an ability for us to scale up. We've gone past the point of no return to have cup at the same scale that we would normally have because of the volume of temporary infrastructure that needs to be brought in to make sure that that experience is as they, as they would see fit. If we move a week down the track and we went to a version of level one, it seems impossible to, to think that's going to happen now based on the, the advice on Monday um, from government. But if that happened, there is the ability to scale up and a wee bit later there's the ability to scale up slightly less, but the ability to scale up. If we can do something safe and make sure that experience is what people want, we'll do it. Don't worry about that. But um, we did put a stake in the ground of when we could operate as we wanted to. Unfortunately, we've gone past that. Darren, just wrap things up for me. How, how are the staff feeling here at Addington Raceway? Because as important as it is for the the province of Canterbury and for the harness racing industry, the people that are involved here at Addington Raceway, this is their passion as well. Yeah mate, it's, it's far from just about me, it's about the entire team that work here, the 70 odd people that, that work across the business. We're running a hospitality and entertainment business, uh, events business at the moment as well that's not op really operating. Um, so we've got staff from the kitchen staff, the finance team, uh, the events and setup team, marketing, the racing department, everyone, the ground staff, everyone that's involved in this loves cup meeting and that's why they do it. Whether they're actually interested that much in racing or not, they know what this means to Canterbury. They're hurting, they know that the clients that we have are hurting. Um, it is what it is. We have to do what we're, we're compelled to do. Um, are we all frustrated? Would we like to just ignore it? Of course we would. Can we? We just can't. And whilst it's very, very important for cup meeting, it's important that we keep racing because that's the main key and that's one of the frustrations we've had in the lead up to these um, scenarios is that we have not wanted to trip ourselves up and have any attention drawn upon us which would have jeopardised cup meeting. Um, but cup meeting will come and go and we still need to keep racing. So we know what we need to do to try and help the industry, to assist the industry with racing. Um, but you know the staff and everyone not just the staff, but the staff here, I can assure you, are taking it pretty hard and uh, yeah, just as frustrated as everyone else.
And a big thank you to Darren. Huge media commitments for him today, uh, Michael. But the upshot of it is that it's what we've expected for the last probably month or six weeks, that we won't have public at the raceway on IRT New Zealand Cup Day. That is unless there is a significant shift in the next 10 days or so. Yeah, I've been left a little bit confused by it, Greg, and I'm going to play devil's advocate because I'm sure people watching this are also slightly confused. So talk, work with me on this, Greg. Is it the case that because of infrastructure and how long it takes to set up and how much it costs to set up, we can't have an, a normal cup day? So that's gone. Is that stage one? We'll correct Pre about that. Pretty much. And, and when you're talking about infrastructure, you're talking about toilet facilities and the ability to service people when they come on course because they have an expectation that there'll be a decent level of food, beverage, and obviously facilities uh, to, to yeah. go to the toilet. Yeah. And obviously there's, there's health and safety comes yeah. into that too, Greg. So I fully understand that and I fully support Addington in that that decision. There's no doubts about that. You can't just put up a whole lot of marquees and some infrastructure in a couple of days. I think what's really interesting is what happens in the next couple of weeks, Greg, and this Friday is going to be huge. It wouldn't surprise me to see a government announcement closer to the, if you're double vaxxed, we're going to give you some more liberties. I think that's coming. The question mark is whether Cup Week in Christchurch falls into that grey area between the level system we've got now and when that happens, which I'm sure the government will have up and running leading into Christmas, which is if you're double vaxxed, you have more liberties, you can do more things. I would have thought Cup Week in Christchurch was a perfect opportunity for the government to say, hey, we need test cases of how people are going to react to this. Perfect let either Rickerton or Addington say, if you're double vaccinated, you can come along. They did the same thing at Ascot last year, and Royal Ascot, of course, which is a far bigger race many than either of ours, and, and say to them, this is a test case, and see how it works for the summer, and also a bloody good way of saying to, to young people or anybody in Canterbury, if you want to get out of the races, you're going to be vaccinated, and that's the rest of your life. That's how it works on our own. Now, I know that's not Addington or Rickerton's call, Greg, I would have thought if there's any loosening in the couple last couple of weeks or next couple of weeks, there's the opportunity to scale up. Greg, I know we're not going to have eight or ten or twelve or twenty thousand people, but do you see realistically an option that if things change in the next ten days, Addington can say, right, we have three thousand people who can come into a general admission situation, come out the front, as long as they stay a metre apart, and we do our best to do that we have the opportunity to have that. Is that how you read the interview with Darren? No, I think so. I'm hopeful, as he probably is, but very cautious. So um, at this stage, hope is, is what we're, we're thinking, but we're not thinking a uh, rather uh, large crowd compared to what we are used to. So we might just leave that there for now and hopefully uh, get some more information each week. And you can just check it out on the Addington Facebook page or at addington.co.nz or hrnz.co.nz for the latest as well. All right, let's move on to racing and concentrate on what's happened in the last week. And we head back to Addington Raceway with a look at uh, the Canterbury Park Cup, yes, with Stevie Golding getting behind this great race, uh, 60th running, and he's just done it again, Michael, Sunday's son. He's powered up here down the straight, and he was nothing short of outstanding. In fact, it was an all-done trifecta Oscar Bonavina storming home and bolt for brilliance right amongst the finish too. Majestic Man wasn't too far away either, but Sunday's son did it again. Well, congratulations, John. An outstanding run from this horse again. He's gone 3.15 once again. Uh, he's just a marvel, isn't he? He sure is, Greg. He's been an unbelievable horse to us. And uh, like you say, he stepped really well. Um, Mick didn't think he could step that good. So, uh, <laughs> no, he stepped great. And I got a nice drag into it. And he actually went to sleep. He's been keen the last couple of races. But he went to sleep out parked, which he normally does. And... Uh, yeah, he knows what that line is. Yeah, he certainly does. A trifecta for the Dunn team. Matt Adiros, gee, he's improved out of sight. He sure is. He's sort of a horse. He's got unbelievable big motors. Gates still, um, I think, Blair had to nurse him a wee bit. Might have cost him up, up the lane, but um, he's got the motor there, so sort out the gate and we'll be there. John, I know there's still a decision to be made as to where you go next, but he loves this place, Addington Raceway. He's likely to be seen in the South Bay Trotters Cup. That'll be definitely our next start and uh, the only start going into the, into the Dominion. So, um, yeah, we'll be able to freshen them up now and go again. Congratulations, mate. Thanks for that. Well, your first steer on in, but I reckon you'd be impressed. Yeah, very good, Greg. You know, he um, 
Just had, had to take a bit of time to balance up up the straight, but once he did, you know, he really found the line good. He stepped up again. Yeah, it's him, Greg, like you say, he's just uh, honest as the day's long and, you know, you've got to tip your hat to him. He hasn't got a bad race, so, uh, you know, he had to do the donkey work again, but like you say, the way he was able to stick on it, it took some smart ones to run past him, so, you know, really pleasing, just another really honest run. Pleasing first up effort. It was, Greg, yeah, you couldn't ask for much more, really, I don't think. Yep. Worked around them, did a, did a bit of work and was right there in the finish and in terms of a preparation towards Cup Week, I think Tony would be happy. Yeah, well, he was pretty happy when he sent him down, but he said he, he's as good as he can with a race, and um, I'm sure he'll improve a heap with that, so, no, it'll be good. Mark, mathematically, he couldn't win, but, gee, you must be happy with that. I'm wrapped with him, Greg. Um, you know, probably it would have been ideal if he had another trial, but going to a trial, he's not going to meet the competition that's here tonight, and he just needed that race fitness now under his belt, so the way he got home and the, some of the horses he run past, I couldn't be happier with him. Mark Ashburton's beckoning, possibly Kai Corey. You've taken him out of the Dominion. Does that mean your target race, obviously, for Cup Week is the free-for-all? Yes, it is, Greg. Two miles is not really his forte, and I, and I just feel the prep he's had, he's, he's going to need another run under his belt as well, and I think uh, you know, he probably needs a little bit more harder racing going into a two-mile race like the Dominion. So our choice was the $100,000 free-for-all Cup day. I reckon you'd be pleased with that. Yeah, we were, Greg. He went a nice race considering the time and the 20 metres and probably second last, I think, at the half and they run home pretty quick. So I'd say Stride Master will say he went OK. We were more than happy. He's in great order and we're building and uh, I think he'll, he won't be too long before he gets a cheque for the owners. Yep. And the cheque you're probably looking for is close to the winning circle at Ashburton where he's won before. Yeah, well, that would be uh, where we hope that he'll show what he can do. Um, he's great off the gate, so that's his chance to put his foot in the till, as they say. Not the ideal start to the preparation. No, it wasn't, no. Well, it's the first time he's, he's been on the unruly, and it's the first time he come off the unruly, and I think the fact that uh, he just froze, he said that he just stood, uh, they were standing there a long time, and uh, he just froze. It's sort of probably... Um, whether we probably might lean to go to Ashburton now just to get a run under his belt because obviously we didn't get one tonight. Um, yeah, just uh, the, the horse is relatively inexperienced as far as um, starts and, and standing starts. So, um, But he, he'll take a lot out of that and whether we end up having to put him back on the unruly, I'll, we'll wait and see, but um, we'll give him one more crack anyway. Right. And midnight dash, usual honest performance? Yeah, yeah, no, he went super. Yeah, 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 I thought he might have gone a fraction better, but in saying that, a good time, and he went round and put on the race, and uh, no, I, it was a nice handy run, and he, he'll only take a lot of benefit out of it. So some really interesting comments there, most notably Michael, obviously Oscar Bonavina coming out of the Dominion. Gee, he was great in that race, though. Nice to see him getting back to something like his best, but... There are a few ticks there, but the biggest tick of all continues on with Sunday Sun. He just keeps on winning. Well, and most importantly, Greg, he's off 20 metres there. Uh, yes, he was a lot fitter than his rivals, but he was still off 20. In the Dominion, which is the only race that matters for punters now with the futures odds available for him, uh, he's going to be up the front. And his manners seem to be pretty good. He connected onto the back of the field there really quickly, so he's not mucking around early like he was in some of his other races. I think he's getting fitter, he's trotting squarely. Lots of positives. Another positive for him, not going to Kai Kura. He'll be better suited going to Addington if they go there for the meeting on the first. There's no reason not to think he's going to win the Dominion Greek unless somebody steps up. And that could be Bolt for Brilliance. Happy with him the other day. I thought he was good. Um, Oscar was really good, but again, not going to the Dominion. Muscle Mountain's a question mark. I see they've now nominated to go to Ashburton. Well, you know, it's a change of plan, and I'm not sure where that puts them heading toward a Dominion. Maybe, maybe they'll change tack. Maybe they'll go to the free-for-all, which could be an easier race for him and, and let him have an easier start to his season. So there's a, it's a great crop. It's a very deep crop, but... Logically, Greg, as much as the second bunch of those horses are going to improve enormously into the Dominion, with the way their handicaps are going to change, 
gee, it's very hard to tip against him to, to defend his title. Yeah, well, the flying mile, of course, at Ashburton on Monday. And a big thank you to Ashburton again getting in behind uh, this show. Majestic Man is the defending champion. We'll have a look at the field now, Michael. He has come up with barrier four. Oscar Bonavina in five. Bolt for Brilliance in six. And Muscle Mountain in seven. I know you haven't had a chance to analyse that race thus far, but what's your initial thoughts around the way the barriers have played out there? I don't think there's a lot of analysis needed, Greg. I mean, Majestic Man, this is their race. This is their chance. This is the free-for-all. Just roll. They roll forward. They get the lead. I doubt there'll be any handing up. In fact, I doubt that'll even be up for grabs or even discussion. So he's got his chance. He's going to need to go better. He, he's been okay this campaign. Obviously not well suited by the handicap. So he gets his chance. I think the big improver will be Bolt for Brilliance, Greg. I liked what I saw from him last week, and he just looked like he would improve with the run. So it's a hell of a race, putting the four of them together across the track there. But clear, advantage, majestic man. Whether that translates to a win, I don't know. I'd like to be talking to Phil Williamson a bit closer to the time. I think I'll do that for Harness Racing New Zealand's website and get his thoughts on where his old mate is at. All right, we're talking about the big trotting races, of course, with uh, Brick and Farms. Let's have a look at the market now for the Dominion. So Sunday Sun, defending champion, we keep on saying that. Uh, the Canterbury Park Cup, of course, he won the ordeal again. Uh, he's $1.60, Michael, four fifty bolt for brilliance. Muscle Mountain drifts out to $9. Matadiros, who was outstanding there first time, really in that grade. I know he won the Banks Peninsula Cup, but uh, he really has stepped up, has it? He? Chief of Staff and Majestic Man getting out to $21. I thought, Michael, just on Majestic Man, you got to remember he ran second in the Dominion last year. thought he was almost getting backable for top three, top four. Yeah, maybe top three, top four. I agree. I agree with you, Greg. Look, this is going to be a stronger Dominion this year than last year. Um, once you add Bolt for Brilliance and Muscle Mountain, they're, they're very good horses who might turn into be, you know, superstars of their time. But it's a no-bet race outside of some place betting because you can't possibly take a dollar sixty for Sunday Sun, that's just lunacy. And you can't back anything to beat him. So that's that, Greg. <laughs> look, at the, look at top three. <laughs> yep, that's the way we might have to look at it. Uh, let's go to the feature pace from Addington Raceway last week. It's with IRT, who, of course, do sponsor the great race, the New Zealand Cup. Here they are turning uh, for home, Michael, and uh, Self Assured's about to get to the outside. There's a whole lot of stuff we have to discuss here. South Coast Arden hits the lead and hits the post first. We're going to hear from the eventual winning driver, promoted winning driver, Mark Purden Short and uh, all the other aftermath and then we'll analyse how the protest was upheld. ...on a nose from self-assured. If he's got beat, he cost himself laying all over the shop halfway down. Mark, he's ended up winning the race, but gee, there was a lot to like about that performance tonight. Yes, he, he was really flying that last sort of 100 metres, Greg, and um, yeah, no, not the way you like to win races, but yeah, when you looked at the film, you, you thought for the margin that it was probably appropriate. The start was good. He was safely away and they were running along early. Yeah, we spent the first sort of lap just chasing. Um, I was pleased I wasn't the one sort of making the ground up. So South Renard, who had to do that work, was a very good run too. Mark, in terms of a preparation going towards the Cup, you must be feeling pretty happy with the defending champion. Yes, yeah, I am. Greg, he's, you know, over the last month, I think he's, you know, got fitter and better and he seems really well and in a good place at the moment. So, uh, no, we're looking forward to the couple more runs under his belt and then Cup Day. Well, you didn't win it, but he went very good. Oh, he went super, Greg, you know. Um, just at the top of the straight, when I just said, took both hands off the reins and pulled his plugs, he did duck up the track, you know, just enough to, to inconvenience the other horse and with the short margin. Um, but, you know, his run was super. Um, he did the work again. I, I would have loved to have driven him with the sit, but, you know, just didn't pan out that way, but couldn't have been happier. In terms of a cup preparation? It's, it's going as well as what it possibly could. It's going good. Um, his manners at the start were a little bit naughty, you know, just circling around. But once he actually stepped, he stepped good. So, you know, I can put up with the, the nonsense as long as he does go away. So that was a positive. Um, he drove, drove good other than that. So, yeah, I think he's, he's on the right track anyway. He's actually gone very good again. He's gone great. Uh, got a nice run, followed the one that eventually got put second. But um, I don't lose too much ground on him. His, little, his old legs were sprinting as probably as fast as they could go, so, uh, and still he, he was still trucking after the line, which is pleasing. Henry Hubert got it right at the start, which again is, is what you guys have been looking for. So the pair of them, where do they head next, or is it still a wee bit up in the air? No, I think 
Oh, they've had a few runs, but the first few weren't that hard a run, so um, weren't that taxing on them. Hopefully they all pull up, good, both pull up good, and uh, might go to Ashburton, and then Kaikoura, and then the Cup. Like, uh, they are racehorses, they're older, and they should be able to handle that. Well, that was much better at the start. Yeah, really good, Greg. That's um, like his old self. He, he can hit it quite quick when he wants to, so, you know, really pleased he, he took that step tonight, and you know, hopefully we can get another couple of runs like that before the Cup and, and get off the unruly would be great. What about the rest of the race? Were you happy enough? Yeah, like happy enough, Greg. Like you say, he had to do a little bit in the middle, which uh, in this grade against those horses, it's probably not his real go in life. But uh, like you say, I just want to take a little bit of luck out of it. And, um, you know, still, still pleased with the way he battled on. Like you say, he was probably the first one home that was in the early burn. 18th career win for self-assured. We've got plenty of footage to look at here, Michael, as a result of the inquiry. I actually spoke to Nick Ergren today. Here's the start, all-important start. You may collect. We'll get to him a little bit later on in the show as he's now been retired. But in terms of the way they stepped away, South Coast Arden, very good. Self-assured, very good. And obviously the Dunn pair away pretty smartly as well. So they settled down like this. And Tim Williams took the option of uh, going around, of course, uh, you may collect. Now, here's uh, where the action is, and you'll get a better look at this head on. Uh, Self-assured ducking in there, and probably people at home are thinking, well, he's caused his own interference, if you like. But when we wind back the tape and give you the head on, Michael, here it is here. So Natalie's just pulled the hood there, and you can see how far he has run up the track, given that the margin was o only a nose. Uh, quite obviously the result had to be reversed. Yeah, it did. Um, that, that's the footage. That's the money shot, the one we showed head on, because this one's side on, you can never quite tell. It doesn't give you the indication because you can't see the outward movement from South Coast Arden. A couple of things to unpack out of this. First of all, it's the right decision. There's no doubts about that. Secondly, they've both gone super. South Coast Arden's been really, really good, self-assured, probably marginally better, but nothing much in it. I think it's good that the stewards inst uh, well, the stewards ruled the way they did because so often in either code, when you have horses which are quasi-stable mates at the moment, they, they are, they're staying at the same place. It could have easily been a case where Mark goes in there and shrugs his shoulders because his partner's driving the other horse and everybody. Well, that's not fair on punters. Now, what we've done here is people have done the right thing. They've said, OK, that was the fair result, fair result, and people who back self-assured got the money they deserved to get. So that was really good, because if it was anything whiffy in the inquiry room, and it was all matey-matey, well, then it would have been a disaster, but it wasn't that. So that's really strong. Secondly, Greg, uh, self-assured for me is marginally the favourite for the New Zealand Cup over the South Coast Arden. But here's where things get interesting. They both had to H. Burton this week, and South Coast Arden's still on the unruly, Greg. So Natalie Rasmussen, who's caretaker training the horse for trainer Brent Mangos, said they discussed that. It's going to get awfully hard to take him off the unruly the way he was behaving before that race because if you put him at barrier two, three, four or five and he's prouncing up and down like that, and I have no idea whether he will. I do not know. It's impossible to tell with standing starts. I've almost given up trying to think about what's going to happen in standing starts. But you wouldn't feel comfortable taking him off the unruly, which Natalie said is Brent's decision to make. So if he's going to Ash Burton there, unless he starts to begin quickly, Greg, he's going to be giving self-assured a start in the New Zealand Cup. Doesn't mean it'll happen that way. One could gallop away, other could make a flyer. But technically, he'll be lined up behind him. Yep. And that's all you need to know. Whether you think they're comparable horses, Greg, very different horses, but if they are of comparable ability, and the only thing we can presume is that everybody steps away safely, even though that's not going to happen, well, then self-assured is going to be in front of South Coast Arden, Greg. And that's what won him the race last year when he got in front of Copy That. No reason to think it's not going to win him the race again this year. Yeah, hard to argue with that. Just back to my comment before about speaking to Nick Ergren. So the siren uh, was blown by the stewards. They then bring the drivers up. So Mark Purden and Natalie Rasmussen in this case. They get them to view the footage. And when you read the stewards report, Michael, it says that uh, Mark Purden instigated the inquiry. So that's the way it works. Now, if he said, no, I don't think there's enough in it, the stewards still have the opportunity to go, we believe there is and go through the process and then get the JCA to rule on it. So it was good to get that insight to find out exactly how it unfolded because I knew that Mark Purden hadn't started the inquiry because he was still on the track when the siren went, but that's mm -hmm. how they uh, progress things now, and I, I think it's the right way. 
It's it's very important. It's important that's happened and people go, okay, well, this isn't just mates or in this case, a couple just running things how they want because yeah. the industry's not for us. It's for the punters. That That's the bottom line. It's not for owners, breeders, forget all that nonsense. The most important people in racing are the punters because if they don't bet, the rest of it falls over. And that showed on Friday night that the stewards and Mark and Natalie – realised their obligation to that and did the right thing. So I thought it was a really good decision, regardless of who you backed. Um, still, South Coast Arden has gone hellishly good. While I've spoken a lot there about self-assured Greg, uh, there's nothing wrong with the way he's going. And if he can step away in the cup, whew, he's going to be incredibly hard to beat over two miles. All right, so let's have a look at the Ashburton Flying Stakes for this week. And the field looks like this, headed up by Pembroke Playboy. He comes up with Barrier 1, Classy Brigade beside him, Self Assured beside him. Uh, then we get out to Vintage Cheddar. Krug, who we'll have a look at uh, in a moment. Laver, who came out of that same trial with him uh, last Friday. Henry Hubert can go, and then of course uh, South Coast Arden. Speaking of uh, Krug, let's go back and have a look at the footage from uh, Addington. That's Laver directly behind them. Uh, Michael, the key to this was Krug stepped away beautifully. 55-9, 27 points four. Uh, here they are running down towards the wire. He was very comfortable, Krug, and really interesting that he's in this week. In this week, and not going to the Breeders' Crown, so Crandall Goody has said, nope, we're not going to Victoria. Um, it's hard to believe Krug's still three, Greg. <laughs> it's one of those really weird ones, because he's now racing in an open class race at three, and people are going to say, when was the last time a three-year-old won an open class race? And, oh, God. It, it gets... It's very tricky for punters to get their mind around. I don't think he'll win anyway, because I think self-assured and South Coast Arden are too advanced for him. Good to see him here over the carnival, though. He's going to add depth to the junior free-for-all and potentially the main free-for-all on show day. And then he can probably you know, be a factor in some of these races in the north before maybe they choose to go uh, to a chariot to fire or something like that, Greg. So you're yeah, good to have him adding glamour to the Cup Carnival. Just with the field this week, obviously South Coast Arden's on the unruly, but it's only a small field, Greg. Yeah. So probably not a big disadvantage this week. Why it would probably be more of a disadvantage for the Cup is while we've had a few horses pull out, we'll almost certainly have a full field. And if we don't have a full field, we'll have a second line of some sort. Yeah. And which means if he remains, and that's Mango's decision, if he remains on the unruly, that's when he would more than likely be giving himself a shorter start. All right, so $2.20 the price now for the favourite, the defending champion in the IRT New Zealand Cup in self-assured. South Coast Arden, two eighty five dollars $5 for copy that. Pembroke Playboy at $11 and $21 for bad to the bone. Just want to talk about the Holmes DG, Michael, before we leave the open class ranks. Uh, the Kerry Hoggard Memorial Holmes DG, uh, $1.85 for copy that. Having a look at his latest winning performance, Michael, of course it was uh, in the Spring Cup. He was too good for them after sitting in the 1-1. One, one. So his price, uh, $1.85, 450 about bad to the bone. Bella Montana, 550. Crucially this week, though, Michael, 30 metres behind copy that. That's a short price for him, giving some pretty smart horses a decent start. I, I totally agree, Greg. It's, he's going to need to go better than he did winning the Spring Cup to win the Holmes DG, and there's no reason to say he won't. He's the best horse in the race, and he could do that. But if a bad to the bone who's off 20 gets around the field and gets four or five horses between the two of them, because last time, copy that as we just saw, sat on his back, vastly different race. I'm waiting to see bad to the bone in front in a good race, Greg. This might be the chance. I know he's off 20, but I don't see many of the horses between him and the front line getting in his way. Yep. I reckon he's the bet this week. I'm not saying he's going to win because it's against the standing start. It gets a bit icky. Bella Montana will improve a bit. Christians have times not too badly off on the 10 metre mark. But Greg, he gets a chance, all things being equal, to get in front of copy that and maybe a long way in front of copy that. And I think if they get the lead, they won't be handing up. So for me, 4.5 for bad to the bone. Not a bad bet in a race, Greg, where I don't want to back anything outside the main two. All right, looking forward uh, to that race. Just back to Addington last Friday night, the horse finishing fifth in that IRT race, of course, was uh, You May Collect and Kirsten Barclay. And uh, the Connections have decided to retire him. Uh, he's the winner of nine from 17. He was an outstanding pacer, as we know. Here he is winning the Uncut Gems uh, and uh, beating Classy Brigade and Triple Eight. Uh, Michael, he earned close to 100,000, uh, but if he didn't have so many ailments, he could have earned 
hurt a whole lot more. It's, it's sad to hear that he won't be seen on the racetracks uh, anymore. Horse of a lifetime is the way Kirsten Barclay is describing him. And uh, yeah, he was an excitement machine, the little bit that we got to see of him. Yeah, and so many people in Southland would be really proud of him, Greg and, and Kirsten and Tank have so much to be proud of too. So, yep, it's a real shame when you see a horse like him who had the ability to beat Triple Weight and beat Classy Brigade, horses who have been placed in the biggest races, um, gets retired before we get to see the best of him. But I am happy, Greg, that he's retired sound enough to live the rest of his life. It would be worse if he broke down badly and did a knee or something which would affect him for the rest of his life. So he'll be well looked after, Greg. But... It, it is always, with a case with a horse like him, it's a, a very much a case of what if. Yeah, exactly. All right, short break coming up for us. When we return on your box seat, we will start looking at the Woodland Sire Stakes, the big group one. Looking forward to that on New Zealand Cup Day. Welcome back into your box seat, of course, with our stable of sponsors, one of which Woodland Start has been with the show for a long time. So let's go back to the heats from last week as we build towards the Group 1 final. Michael, here's Blame It on the Night. Two from two now, and uh, Peter Ferguson pinch hitting here for Tony Early. Went super two. We're back at the start, missed the early burn, but some of the horses he's beating here, Major Perry, who was extremely good in the duels, a long way behind Akuta, but beat the rest home. So if he's beating him, blaming on the night who remains unbeaten in two, is a good horse heading forward for Tony Hurley. Greg, one of the questions people having a bet is, is he as good as this horse, Republican Party? This is Addington on Friday night. Three on the bounce for him to this campaign. Went forward at the start and he was incredibly dominant. Check out this last 100 metres then check out the comments of Leon. He wins it easily, beats my ultimate Chevron. Third Bubba Scrub cut and run, runs four. Well, you thought he was nice and that proved he is. Yeah, he's a genuine weak horse, Greg, and um, you know, I just said to Cran, I'm not really sure where the bottom of him is yet, so he just keeps doing things, you know, step by step. But yeah, I think he's a pretty nice animal. First up against the older horses that don't often do what he did to that field, and then tonight you chose to press forward, I suppose. It's not a statement race, but you, you needed to show the others just what your options could be on Cup Day. Yeah, well, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but when I noticed a few of them weren't going forward early, Greg, we sort of had to, and he done the rest there. And, you know, he's pretty casual about everything, but... You know, he's doing it all, all very well, so yeah, future's bright for him. He's not big in stature, you're on the favourite for this race, the size final last year in Krug. I'm not asking you to compare them, but uh, he, he's certainly going in the right direction. Yeah, for sure, you know, he's obviously he's beautifully bred and that's shining through as well, so he's got a great trainer and that helps too, so yeah, all looking forward. So my ultimate Chevron was excellent in that race. He continues on after winning the Sapling uh, early on in his career, his first start, in fact, uh, Michael. Bubba Scrubs was good too. And back to that heat uh, at Cambridge. Uh, really good run from Mr Ibiza, now trained by Todd Mitchell, who was first up without a trial. So there'll be some improvement there too. Yeah, I think lots of them were improved, Greg. I think they're going to need to, to beat the Southerners. Franco Indy and Republican Party appear to have a bit on most of them, but still... Tony Hurley, his horse, blaming on the night, might be untapped. We don't really know how good he's going to be. Uh, Montana DJ was the horse who, who underperformed on his best form last year, Greg, and he's the horse who there's question marks about heading into the next heat. This is this Friday night at Alexandra Park. Newcomer to the ranks there, Greg, a horse called Paul Lee D, who won not an overwhelming maiden race, but very impressively last time out. This is him, this little Paulie in front. This was the race which was delayed originally because there was an accident at the first take. The way he hit the line here, Greg, clearly he's a smart horse, but when the market was released for this Sire Stakes heat on Friday night, Greg, I must admit I'm surprised how short he is. Incredibly short, 
considering the calibre of the opposition, even though they were beaten at Cambridge last week. Yeah, $1.65. We'll have a look at that market for you shortly. Uh, out of Snooky, owned by Suzanne Hurlihy, so the family they know very well. And from Barrier 1, he gets his chance. Now, Montana DJ's come up with the three. He's a $9 shot, and $3.80 is the price about Major Perry. Really intriguing heat, Michael. Mr. Ibiza comes up with uh, Barrier 5. And those are the ones that look likely to fight out the finish. Um, but you're right, $1.65 for Paulie D, extremely short. We'll get to the heat at Ashburton shortly, where Blame It On The Night is about to make its first southern appearance. Yeah, it's awfully short. Um, and I couldn't take it, possibly. I, I can't imagine he's going to go around $1.65. He was enormously punted on the tote, actually, last time out. But Major Perry's at least as proven as him. Maybe his improvement curve is steeper than we think, but I would think Major Perry the better value, not saying he'll beat the other horse because Paulie D has the inside draw. And good to see Tony with potentially two really smart horses heading to the side stakes. Here's a reminder of Franco Indy and how good he was in his heat. And, of course, they go to Ashburton. We just don't have that field in front of us as we record this, but uh, he was excellent at beating Can't Find a Better Man. And uh, I still think between him and Republican Party, as you quite rightly point out, Michael, they are the ones to beat. Uh, Republican Party, of course, won't be at Ashburton, but it'll be interesting to line up blame it on the night and see where he's at. He's actually a $13 shot, blame it on the night, for the final. We now have equal favourites, Michael. Franco Indy and Republican Party, $2.60. Then you go out uh, to that $13, blame it on the night, and can't find a better man. It does look a race in two, and it almost looks like whoever draws inside the other is likely to start favourite on the day. Yeah, might start favourite, Greg. Not sure they'll win. It's, it's been a remarkable race, the size stakes for barrier draws uh, and horses being able to overcome very wide draws or second line draws. So, yeah, jury's out. Um, 2.6, I presume you might be able to take that on Franco Indy now because if he wins his star, a size stakes heat on Monday, Greg, maybe he could in, gets into a dollar eighty ish But there's no real spoil in doing this, Greg. I like these markets being open early. But there's very rare any logic in backing the favourites in the early markets. Greg, if you like one at $40, roll the dice. If you lose, you're not putting much on. You need to put a fair bit on at 2.6 to make it worth your while, all things being considered. And then you're probably betting on the draw because, as I said, what it doesn't affect the result sometimes, it definitely affects the market. Let's go back to Addington Raceway, a key undercard race with a few trying to force their way into the IRT New Zealand Cup. One of those is Terry, another of those is Typo. That's Typo uh, getting to the park position, Terry up the passing lane for the Regan Todd team. Uh, they just keep on firing up and he's a horse that's now won five races, Michael, and he's going in the right direction, isn't he? Yeah, I think he is. He reminds me a little bit of a horse like Cranbourne and one of those horses who hasn't arrived on the scene with any glamour and then they just keep on winning and winning and doing a good job and he looks a horse who's still got a bit of maturing to do when you look at his gate front on Greg. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he edges his way to open class. Typo's an open class horse more or less now. So, yeah, he's, he's a really good horse for Regan heading forward. And one thing about Regan, you know, Greg, is that the horse will get the best possible service. He, he doesn't stuff them up much. So I would suggest the horse is, is going to make his way to open grade when and where that happens. Uh, I think probably the second half of, well, sorry, the second half of the year, maybe the first half of next season. So <laughs> Whatever typo, that is. Yeah, Typo and Terry, you think the Cup's a bridge too far this campaign? 100%. Yeah. There's no, one of the biggest mistakes I think a lot of trainers, and it's never usually the trainers who want to do it, it's the owners, is putting horses in the cup who can't win because they want to have a horse in the cup. And I think that's great. I understand the enthusiasm for it, but it doesn't matter if it's a seven-year-old gelding, you're chucking it in and, and doesn't really matter. But with those good horses heading forward, Greg, um, I think Cranbourne's earned the right to go there. I think there's no doubts about that. But those horses just below that when they're coming through probably does them more harm than good to go in the New Zealand Cup. Most other races don't. But, Greg, when they go in 53, 54 for two miles, it gives them a pretty big headache. I'd rather be winning a $25,000 race, Greg, on New Zealand Cup Day than running 10th in the New Zealand Cup. Yep, hard to argue with that. Life's a beach is heading to the Breeders' Crown, as we know, but she keeps on winning here on her way uh, across the Tasman. Once she found the frontier, Michael, the most remarkable thing was her price. 
Yeah, it was a very comfortable watch once she got to the lead. Now, she's had a bit of a backwards and forward situation here. She's won. Uh, second horse, actually, here, really good too. But she was going to be trained for the Breeders' Crown by Josh Dickey and his partner, Sammy Kilgour, but they've had their trip delayed. So Josh is sticking around in New Zealand because of COVID restrictions and travel and all that sort of stuff. So he can't go till November the 19th, which is good news if you have a horse in Auckland, because he can have a drive for you, because we're a bit short on drivers north of the border. But bad news for his taking over the training of this horse, Greg. So I think she'll probably end up going to Nathan Purden, and Anthony Butt will probably do some of the driving. But of course, Nathan could also have a better twist. So that might depend which heats of the breeders' crown they end up in. So a little bit of a setback there. Don't worry, there's plenty of good drivers in Australia, Greg, who will love to get on Life's a Beach. But... She's going to a wickedly, wickedly strong division of the Breeders' Crown when you consider ladies in red and better twists are already there. Yeah, and awaiting uh, for her. Tony Barron's team absolutely flying at the moment, though, so congratulations to him the way they are going. Time for us to take a short break here on your box seat. When we come back, we'll cross the Tasman with Garrards and check out what happened over the weekend, including further success for the man they call TR. Well, we're in the home straight in your box seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors, one of which is Garrard's Horse and Hound. Uh, both sides of the Tasman, uh, check out their stores or go online. Uh, here's a good performance, Michael. Queen Elida, trained by Tony Barron. Yes, the stable that's in very good form. Uh, trained in Australia by Brent Lilly and, of course, Chris Alford doing the steering. Gee, this was a brave run from her. Yeah, she was excellent. This is uh, the Victorian Trotting Oaks, and she had to work a lot harder than the horses chasing her down early doors. Got the lead, and Greg, she's beautifully bred. Um, she's just going to be a beautiful broodmare for Tony's band heading forward, and they can't take that group one away from you. Good on your lilt. Well done to him too, and well done to Tony. Here is Spellbound. This is the make by Cullen at Ballarat last Saturday night, and Greg, I don't know what's happened to Spellbound. She was always a nice horse in New Zealand, but in Australia she's become a big, bold and brave type of a pacer. Maybe it's the drop in grade, Gregory, but she is absolutely loving it over there for Nathan Purden, who, of course, has a slightly better mare in Amazing Dream going around as well. So, Greg, um, he's really got some firepower to work with, has Nathan Purden. Yeah, I'll tell you what has happened to her. She's won 10 races now. Congratulations to Nigel Armstrong and the big ownership group, the witches who are all in behind uh, her. She just keeps on getting better, and she's winning a lot of money over there. She's a six-figure uh, earner, and uh, that won't stop in the short term in terms of the way she's going. Bit unlucky in that race, the Pantheus, but um, Spellbound was simply too good having to work harder than any other horse in the race. Wanted to preview some other races uh, leading to the weekend. Of course, Monday at Ashburton is going to be huge. Uh, we've got a Phillies and Mears race uh, where Betters Tart goes around. This is her finishing second at the trials. This one uh, trained by Brent White, so locally trained. I know we haven't got the draws in front of us, Michael, but she is pretty smart, this girl. She went around in some good races uh, last time in and uh, home nicely here under a strong grip from Stephen McNally. She'll be competitive regardless. Well, horses like this are worth following, Greg, because you know they've got ability and they're going to go to cup days or Ashburton's and places and sometimes they're going to win and sometimes they're going to run fifth and go super. So this is the time of year, Greg, where the fields are so strong um, and we haven't seen her feel fresh, Burton, yet, that you watch them go and don't get dirty on them if they finish fourth or fifth and you lose your money, Greg, because these races are so strong over the next month, a lot of horses are going to get beaten, then come out and win their next start. So punters, follow the good ones, 
even if they don't give you joy at the first time you back them. Here's another really good one, Michael, of course. She was good enough, need you now, mm. to win the first race on Jules Day. That's her in the done colours, ducking to the inside. Uh, the winner of this race, Better Talk Art. We just watched her finish second fresh up at Addington. That's It's All About Faith, the size stakes winner, uh, drifting back to third, and Pelosi in fourth position. So a really strong trial, 56-6-27-4. Talking about Nija now, she'll improve, I'm sure. But the way the barrier draw works out, uh, it's sequential. Uh, so the uh, worst horse draws one, obviously, Michael. But the best horse draws the outside of the second row. That's the way it works at Ashburton. So Pelosi will draw the outside of the second row. And drawn to her inside will be Nija now. They're both going to be very, very competitive, Michael. Especially Pelosi. And I'll tell you more about that as the show unfolds. Yeah, she's a pretty good horse, Pelosi. Um, need you now. I know both horses pretty well. I'm not sure Pelosi's any better than Need you now. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it unfolds. I, I would say a lot of it's going to be luck in the running between those two, and this won't be the last time they meet in their careers. They'll be banging heads in the mayor's races for sure. Here's a horse heading towards the IRT New Zealand Cup. Now, I've looked back over history. I'm absolutely sure that the Tuapeka Cup winner hasn't gone on and won a New Zealand Cup. But that's Robin's playboy angling to the back of Self Assured. He finishes fifth in this, Michael. He's shooting for his third consecutive Tuapeka Cup win. He goes around on Sunday, not at Forbury Park where it's traditionally held. Of course, it'll be at uh, Invercargill. He starts off the 10 metres alongside Chuckles, some kind of wonderful, and Memphis, Tennessee, who was recently withdrawn from the Cup, and further back off 20 metres will be Johnny Mack. If he goes like he just did there, Michael, in the Canterbury Classic, he'll be winning his third Tuapika Cup for the Wilsons, I'm sure. I didn't know that. I didn't know one two two picker cups. That's pretty cool. Uh, I think he won three. He was super there. Been really good. He's a horse who could run top five in the New Zealand Cup. And yep, if he behaves himself, he'll be too good for them on Sunday. One would suggest, Greg, great meeting Sunday to bet to load up the account. All right. What about best bets of the week before we get to some hits and misses? What have you found for us this week, Michael, with Rakiro Racing? Time, huh? Regal Tire was a dreadful watch last time. It actually ran into a horse who galloped in front of it and got knocked out of the race after about 20 metres. Heads to a 1980 mobile start at Addington. Inch perfect type of race for him. So Regal Tire for me, Greg, so far I've had a scratching in two seconds out of three tips. So it can only get better. All right, I'm going to go for Pelosi. I reckon she'll be in the right spot. Blair Orange doing the steering. Uh, had to launch her from the 800 to the 400 because they were going slow in that race uh, the other night. Uh, and she just blew out. She's in the three-wide line with one shot at them. With that run under her belt, I reckon she'll be extremely hard to beat. So check that out. The Phillies and Mears mile there on Monday. What about some hits and misses? Well, the uh, hits included Republican Party, Self Assured, Sunday Sun, all-American lover who got smashed from, I think, an open quote of about 320 and Taurus Bromac. Couple that missed out. We spoke to Crandell Getty the other day, Michael, on SENZ, and he said Invitation only would be winning at pretty short notice. Uh, he went a great race. Typo missed out there. South Coast Arden and, of course, uh, Darling Me. But there's the hits and misses. Anything take your eye? The yeah, Invitation only was good. Yep. Strong race. Went well, Greg. Won't be a maiden for long. It's a confusing time, Greg. Lots of people feeling a bit of emotion today after all the announcements and everything going on with the Cup Week. But hang in there. Um, I think, Greg, some better times are ahead and just around the corner. And I know it's emotional for everybody, Greg. But there's one bunch of people who don't get to be emotional, Greg. There's one bunch of people who don't get to be upset that there's no Cup Day at Melbourne Cup Day at Ellerslie. That's the unvaccinated, Greg. Yep. They don't get to be emotional about this. They don't get to have an opinion anymore because everybody else is sick of hearing from them. So if they want to go to the races ever again, ever get vaccinated. Again, go get vaccinated, Greg. All right. Kaikoura Cup Day uh, with Alabar, of course. So we've been running a competition. Last chance for you to enter. Uh, and you do enter by uh, going to the box seat nz at gmail.com. Last chance to get uh, your correct entry in and then we'll draw one winner. Has an aged pace winner gone on and won the IRT New Zealand Cup? Go to hrnz.co.nz, look up the major race winners and you will be able to find the answer to that. Uh, William Wallace was successful in the aged pace 
last year. So therefore, that was the correct answer last week. So a big thank you to all of those who have placed entries. And of course, four people as a result of that draw will get to go to Kaikoura Cup Day there on the Monday. Michael, that completes the show for this week. Big thank you for your input once again. Really important weekend coming up. Alexandra Park uh, with the Holmes DG and, of course, Flying Stakes Day on Monday. It's going to be huge, Greg. We're getting close now. It's getting exciting. And, yeah, whatever happens, whether you're going or not going or can't go or can go, we're going to make sure you have all the information, including the traditional box seat New Zealand Cup preview show. We're going to have that to get you right into the spirit for Cup Day, Greg. That's one thing. That's not going to change. All right. You enjoy your harness racing week ahead. We will both see you in seven days' time.